Okay, 10 more games in this half, as we lovingly call the trash half. <laughs> the last of the trash begins now. Snick and Mike's top 100 games. But does anyone care what they have to say? Please. I know I don't. Cause they may doubt, they may scream, they may say some things that are plain wrong. Dab on it, dab on it. But they are dumb, dumb bing bongs. Matthew Juice better. <laughs> <laughs> What's up everybody, my name is Nick. I'm Mike. We are the brothers Murph, and yes, this is gonna be our 60 to 51. This is the last 10 games it's, in this, the back half of the top it's 100. It's getting properly exciting now. It's getting very exciting. I do love doing our top 100. Uh, it's fun. Very, very excited. Uh, if you have not seen the rest of our top 100, first of all, watch the other ones. Uh, what are you doing? And then second of all, we have been up. talking uh, about how we've been partnering with Tabletop Alliance for this uh, top 100. You can donate over there. over there. It's a really cool nonprofit where they're trying to get games into the hands of school kids. They're working directly with teachers. If you are a teacher, you can work with them to try and get some games for your students. It's really, really, really cool. You can donate your games as an address down in the description below, or you can give money directly, which really helps because every buck you give helps one kid. It gets a game into their hands. How cool is that? And so, like, five bucks, five kids. It's super awesome. Make sure to donate. If you got a couple extra bucks, it's a season of giving. Let's give some stuff. But, Mikey, yo, let's get through these games so we can get to the good games. I finally am so excited. Let's get into number 60 right now. <laughs> Number 60 is a game that I definitely personally evangelize quite a bit. These games bit. are so bad, Nick. Go faster. <laughs> <laughs> I personally evangelize this game a lot. This is Wendake. Yeah. Wendake is a game you that... Are, you are Wendake's champion. I am Wendake's champion. I recently taught it. I didn't even play it. I just taught it uh, That's at, right, a, yeah. at a local con. So, right. And they liked it too because it's great. I love Wendake. Wendake is a game where you are the Wendat people, which is a Native American tribe up in like the kind of Michigan area, the Great Lakes yeah. region. Um, and this is a, a action selection, area control kind of game where you are uh, given a specific tribe which might give you a special ability. And then you are doing actions in a very interesting action selection system, which I always talk about when I talk about this game because I've never seen it before and I would like to see it again because I think it's really cool. Yeah. Where you essentially have an, a three by three grid of action tiles and you are gonna activate them bingo style. So you can activate like a row, you can activate a column, or you can activate one of the diagonals. Yeah, tic-tac-toe action, yeah. And you can activate them in any order, so you can be like, okay, I'm gonna do this one, and then I'm gonna do this one, and then I'm gonna do this one. And then at the end of that round, those are gonna flip over to their other, to their backside, and the backside, all the backsides are one kind of action. Yes. Um, and then at the end of the round, you will push the tiles off so that the bottom row of tiles comes off your board. You will get a new tile, which is a much better tile, and then you'll shuffle that new tile within two of them, you'll throw one of them away, and then you'll put them at the top of your action board again. That'll be refreshed. So every round, you're cycling through a row of your um, a row of your actions. You're going da, 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 da. and it's a very interesting action selection system because again, after you use it that round, then that action flips down. So you can't do that action again until it comes off your board right. and then comes back onto your board. <clears throat> And it's just so interesting. And then throughout the game, you're also getting better versions of essentially the action tiles you already have. And it's just super, super interesting. But in the game, you are going around the board. You have a kind of an area control board which scales with the player count, which is also really, really nice. Yeah. And you're putting down your hunters and you're putting down your gatherers. Your hunters will go out there and they're gonna be gathering like pelts, like beaver pelts and stuff like that. Your gatherers will be having like farms. So you can get like some beans, you get some pumpkins, corn, stuff like that. And then you also have these little warrior meebles are essentially going around protecting your people because you can go into other people's areas and you can like fight your warriors and essentially take over their spots. It's kind of area control stuff. And then if that happens, then your, your hunters and gatherers and your warriors will come back to your longhouses to rest because they get injured. No one dies, which I think is kind of nice too. You're still yeah, like, I'm just going to take, gonna take a nap. I'm going to take this bean farm real quick. You just go over there. Yeah. And you go back into like your longhouse and you can bring them back out and stuff like that. And there's all these different ways of scoring. There's essentially four different scoring tracks. It's like a trade track, like a military track a mask track, because masks were very important to this part of the, uh, the, the world in that, that culture. And then the last one was like a ritual track. And then two of those scoring things will be paired together randomly. So two will be up here, two will be down here. And on each side, at the end of the game, whatever your lower of those two scores is your score for that, that yeah. half. So you have to balance. So you kind of have to do all four of them equally as possible, because you're only going to score your two lowest, essentially. 
and it's super, super interesting, and it's just really, really good. It feels very different than pretty much any other game because that Agreed. action selection system, it's got some area control, but that's not like the entire game. You have resource management, different things that you can do, but it just comes down to that action selection, which I love so much. I think it's so interesting. It can be used in so many different ways, and I've never seen it again, never seen it beforehand, and it's cool. And again, it's about Native American people, but it's done in a respectful way. They did research and stuff like that. The Wendat people didn't live in like teepees. They lived in longhouses because people in that area, they lived in longhouses, not teepees. And it says so in the thing. They're like, look, there's no teepees because people in this area didn't live in teepees. Wouldn't make sense. So I'm like, hey, thanks for doing that. That's really cool. Like way to not just be like, they all have totem poles and teepees. And it's like, like no, right. that's literally not correct at all. That's a way to do it. But So um, so yeah, Wendat is really, really fun. I think it's a, a sleeper game that like came out and just immediately went on the radar no one ever talked about it again it was weird yeah and i really like it we saw it at a gen con on um on renegade game shelf we were like what is this game and we bought it kind of blindly and yeah. i love it. it used to be my top How 10 lucky is that that we did that oh my gosh <laughs> i love it i think Wendake is so good it's a game that i personally evangelize like non-stop and yeah. so i love me some Wendake. it's my number 60 mikey my number 60 uh you mentioned before in a previous list it's pure dexterity and nothing else this is crokinole yeah I, I, I knew this would be higher for you yeah crokinole is so stinking fun because it's the simplicity of your flicking discs yeah if there's no opponent on the board you want to get into the innermost ring uh, ideally into the very center and score 20 points that are guaranteed which is nice uh if there's another player color uh you have to Carry them off of that. You have to just touch even the littlest bit for that play to be legal. So there's like those couple parameters. And then from there, there's this kind of tactical flicking and trying to knock your opponent off because ultimately there's cancel scoring. So if we have all the same discs and all the same levels, they all cancel each other. No one scores any points. Nothing. So you're trying to get as many of their discs off the board completely, or at least you are having more of your discs clo closer to the center to score points. And this first one, 100 points wins. It's just really fun. It's really elegant and simple. The rule yeah. set is just like not heavy. It's just like flick stuff. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of skill that can come involved. There's a lot of cool, like crazy trick shots where you bounce off one of the pegs and then you go over here and you carry them off of there and you rebound into the middle and it's just like epic. Um, what more can I say about Crokinole? It's fantastic. It's my number 60. It's so good. So good. It's just the greatest game I've ever made. So good. Um, all right, that's 60. Let's get into 59. Winner 59 is all about putting on a fancy ball, and you want to be the person that made the ball the fanciest, and this is Rococo. Mm. This is a game where you are uh, really kind of a, a renaissance person. Like, you're, you're doing all sorts of uh, stuff mostly to do with getting fancy people dressed for the Truth. occasion. So you're building dresses and coats and things for uh, different guests that will require different types of fabric and sometimes some like lace and silk and things like that. Uh, but you can also, it's like fund magi uh, magicians, that'd be awesome. Fund magicians. Musicians <laughs> uh, to perform during the event. You can uh, put statues out front to help beautify mm -hmm. this already very magnificent house. You can fund fireworks happening. and stuff. You can fund fireworks and stuff. So you basically want to have your fingerprints on as many parts of the party as possible. And it does it through uh, kind of a deck building. Uh, yeah, a little bit of deck building. Not a ton yeah. of deck building, but some deck building. And uh, playing out cards, card playing, that are going to select your actions for you. And the cool thing is you have different levels of workers. You have these kind of apprentices, journeymen, and the masters and stuff. And there's certain action spaces that require a master to go there. If you're going to hire a new worker, you're not having the new guy hire the other new guy. You're going to have the master make these decisions. The journeyman can go... Uh, and get you know better versions of, of silk and, and uh, fabrics sometimes because the action they have associated will give you a bit of a perk or a discount. So that's what's really fun is like the idea that certain workers are, are can only go to certain spaces. Yeah. Um, and then the action of the card itself that you play might give you a bonus thing that might be related to the action you chose or something that's like a uh, I'm doing this action over here and getting uh, you know basically coats and stuff uh, and I can the bonus on that's gain a fabric tile. So it's like, okay, I'm gonna recoup some of my fabric that I just spent to make these uh, clothes for people and stuff. Mm -hmm. So this is a really good action selection system throughout the game. And ultimately you wanna have kind of the, in each of the rooms of the house, you wanna have the majority of stuff in that room. Yeah. Like you did the musician and you dress more people so you get the points because you have the area of majority yeah. in that room. So a little bit area control kind yeah, of yeah. in its way. There's a lot of little stuff in the game. Yes, there is. A lot of little elements. A little bit of deck building, a little bit of area control, a little bit yes. of resource management, a little bit of this. There's a lot cool. of... It, it, like that. There's, it's not a lot of any one thing. Yeah, and that's what, it's just a beautiful blend of a lot of different things yeah. that we enjoy in other games, and Rococo really goes down smooth. We have the older version, um, and it's just great. It's a great game. It's great. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, I didn't make a top 100, but I do I do love me some Rococo. Yeah. All right, so that was your 59, yeah? 
That was 59. Right, my number 59 is one I think Mike mentioned last list, and this is Key Flow. Yeah, Key Flow, yeah. which is kind of a successor to Key Flower. It's better than Key Flower. Fight me. Um, and so. Uh, physically assault me. Physically assault Don't do me. Don't do that. Um, I like Key Flow a lot. Key Flow, again, is a, a successor to Key Flower. It's very similar in a lot of different ways, except for it's a card drafting version of kind yep. of Key Flower. Uh, and a lot less mean. But again, this is a game where you're gonna be going through four seasons, going through an entire year. You have spring, summer, fall, and winter. You'll be drafting out these cards. And in spring and summer, these cards are mostly gonna be uh, kind of action cards where they're gonna allow you to activate them and do certain things. They're gonna produce resources like stone or wood or gold or coal or something like that. And then in autumn, you're going to start getting some cards that are going to be giving you end game scoring, and then winter is going to be only end game scoring right. cards. Right, you're not going to be building up your engine anymore. No, there's no point to it anymore. And then on top of that, you're also going to be drafting out, uh, along with these building cards, these uh, keeple cards, which are essentially going to be the way you activate these buildings. They're essentially going to be a card with like an arrow pointing like down, and basically you're going to put it on top of a, a building, and it's here, you're saying, I'm activating this. But they can also point left and right, and what that is is because kind of like in Keyflower, is you can activate your neighbor's stuff. Yeah. Um, but unlike Keyflower, there's no blocking. Like if I go like, okay, I'm going to put this one down, the arrow on the left, I'm gonna activate Mary's thing over here. I'm gonna do this, but that doesn't block it for her. It just means I'm just gonna use it. You don't even really need to announce it to them. You can be like, I'm using that, because it doesn't make a difference to them. It doesn't hurt them, it doesn't help yeah. them, it doesn't do anything. It's like, all right, neat. And one thing that's nice about it is this game is like, it goes for like one to six players, but the cool thing is, it's kind of like seven, one or something like that. The only thing that matters is your neighbors. You can't ever yeah. activate anything other than your neighbors. So it's kind of nice, because with bigger player counts, it doesn't, with the exception of the fact that you just have more people thinking about stuff, it doesn't like it's all elongate the play. game. Yeah, it's all simultaneous play because again, you can't affect each other. We like multiplayer solitaire games, which is why, why I like this more than Keyflower. And it's really, really cool. And so then when you get to the end game scoring stuff, all these end game scoring cards, you have to have the stuff on that card. So if this card would be like, hey, if you have five wood, you get five points. If you have 10 wood, you get so many points. You actually have to move that wood to that card. And on top of that, there's be a lot of things where like, hey, for every set of like cow, pig, and sheep you have, you'll get this many points. And on the cards you're putting down, there might be cows, pigs, and sheeps. But everything can only score for one, one thing. Card, so this yeah. particular cow can only score for one card. So if you have a card that's like one point per cow, and then this one's like one point <sighs> per set of cow and sheep, you have to choose which ones are going where. You really gotta think of like, what's gonna be the most effective use of these so resources that I have? Once the game ends, there's definitely a lot of like, okay, <laughs> sitting back and let me like, figure out how mm. to make the most of my score. But I really, really like it. I think it's outstanding. It works really well at two. Um, in these kinds of like games where you're working with your neighbors, don't generally, and this one actually works quite well at two. Agreed. I really like it. I think it's great. It's also relatively quick. I think Key Flow is absolutely outstanding. And it's better than Key Flower. Fight me. Physically assault me. <laughs> um, and that's my number 59. Let's get a 58. My number 58, I'm astonished. Astonished. Mine is hot. This is higher on my list than it was on yours. This is a little bit of scoot. Scout, baby. I'm astonished this is higher than it was uh, on your list. Yeah, that is Scout. kind of weird. I a, play it so much. You do. <laughs> you do. Uh, Scout is a game, um, a kind of a ladder climbing game where you are uh, building ladders um, and then you're climbing them to get to the higher ladders. Because then you can you scout with your binoculars because you have a height advantage. Boom. You're spying on your neighbors. There you go. Call the cops. Um, but no, this, this is a game where you're in a circus for some reason. You're a peeping Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're technically a circus theme. It's colorful. That's what I like about it. But no, this, it, this it is, is a colorful. game where you have a, a hand, you're given a random hand of cards, all sorts of different numbers. Each card has a top half and a bottom half. Those, those will be different numbers. So it could be like eight and a two or something like that. Sure. When you get your hand of cards, you are not allowed to rearrange your cards. You're not allowed to put all your stuff together. But what you can do is flip your entire hand over. So what you're trying to do is figure out when you first get your cards, like, okay, do I want this side or do I want this side? And you kind of flip back, ah, oh, no, I think I want this side. Right. And then what's gonna happen is when it, the first player is gonna put down a card in the middle, or I guess they can put down multiple cards. They put down a two. The next person has to beat that card. They can do it with a higher value card than that, so they put down a two. They can put down a five. That beats that, and the next person could put down a seven. But what beats one card? Two cards. So the person could put down a run. They could do one, two, or three, four, or seven, eight, or something like that. That would beat a single card. Whenever you beat something, you then get to take that card and put it in your little pile. Every card you have at the end of that round is gonna be a victory point. Yep. 
Plus, it's cards out of your hand, which you ultimately won. Exactly. You, that's how the round is going to end, is you hopefully mostly will get because someone ran out of cards. Yep. So then what beats a run? A set. So if you have a 9-10, a 1-1 one, one will beat that because a set always beats a run. But then what beats a set of two or a run of two? A runner set of three and so on and so forth. So it's a ladder climbing game. You always have to put something, down something of a higher value within the confines of this rule set, right? And then you also are getting those cards. But sometimes you can't beat it or you might not want to beat it. And so in that case, what you do is called scouting. So what's gonna be a scouting? So Mike put down something, I can't beat it or I don't want to. I'm gonna go, here's a victory point. You give Mike a victory point from the pool. And then I get to take one of the cards that's down on the table. If there's four cards, you can only ever take the ones on the sides. Yeah, I gotta be, yeah. But the cool thing is you take this card and then you get to put it in your hand. The nice thing is you can put it wherever you want and you can put it on either side. And so if I have- It's so necessary. <laughs> if I have a nine, a nine, and a nine, and I pick up this one nine card, I can go boop, now I have four nines. And so much of the game is based around trying to manipulate your hand to make it stronger. So if I have 10, 10, one, 10, I can hopefully play that one at some point and now I have three tens together. Yeah, that's one of the most exciting parts is like, how do you get the, the pieces of your hand together? And that's when, when you're choosing your hand at the very beginning of the game, that's what you're trying to see. You're trying to see, okay, how can I get the things in here? To, how easy can I get them together? Like to play a single one is very difficult. It, almost impossible. Nigh impossible. Like, yeah. But you can't do it. So it's very, very fun. It just works. It's in a little oink box. It's absolutely outstanding. We take it everywhere to the point where we can't even find it because we've taken it so many different places. <laughs> We were looking for it yesterday. Can't find it. It's, it's somewhere. somewhere in this it's somewhere. Room. I don't I know where. Swear if I you see it, see let us know in the comments. I don't see it. But nonetheless, it's around because we take it everywhere. Scout is absolutely incredible. It's my 58. I'm astonished I had it higher than Mike. Very nice. That is surprising. That is surprising. Uh, uh, astonished. My number 58 is a game. Uh, this was a very early on game that you played before me. And it, again, was one of those moments that like changes the landscape of what board games can be. This is Suburbia. Oh, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. Suburbia, tile oh, lane this... game. God, why do you hate this game so much? What? No, man, no. We're not judging my list. Mike 58's hates this a game. perfectly my acceptable gosh, number. we should be higher than this. Suburbia is a great game. It is. It could be. It was in the trash half of the list, but unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Suburbia is a tile lane game. It's a city building game. So yeah. you're going to place all these hex hexagonal uh, tiles down. Uh, and they are going to be different types of uh, business buildings or, or kind of infrastructure or, or um, what am I looking for? Yellow. It's like uh, industry. 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 Commerce. Industrial. Sorry. Yeah. Industrial. <laughs> or like green or kind of like uh, residential yeah. uh, tiles and stuff. And you're trying to ultimately have the biggest city you can in terms of population. Your population is your points. Yeah. Uh, and you're trying to make sure you can sustain all that stuff by maintaining a robust income. You want your city to make money so you can expand your city. You gotta get a Starbucks in there. And you gotta get a Starbucks Easy in there. Easy money. And so all this game comes down very much to like adjacency to tiles you place. So if you have a freeway tile and you place business things next to it, that's gonna be good because people are trying to commute to work. And so there's a lot of like the intuitive. You're not trying to put an airport next to a housing district. That'd be bad because for that's business. bad, right? Yeah. right? That's how you. That's what happens if you live in North Hollywood or Burbank, California. <laughs> Yeah, you have an airport above your head. Always. Um, which is kind of rough. Um, uh, LA's a hellscape that had no city planning whatsoever. I love it. Um, and so it's really fun to consider, like, what tiles do I have available? How am I going to build this? How do I put this over here so I don't, like, incur, like, penalties for the placement and the adjacency to other types of things? Uh, and then the fun thing that's really interesting is as you progress, you're getting more and more population. The, the small town charm starts going of away. your city starts your town going becomes less away. desirable. It's less desirable. Yeah. Because now it's getting busy and kind of packed and there's traffic and stuff. And so that's represented by as you go up the score track, you will cross these red lines. And every time you cross a red line, you must reduce your income uh, and your population track by one. Your reputation, yeah. Your reputation, sorry. Yeah. Your reputation, which gives you population. Yeah. Uh, the, your reputation, your income go down. Your city's more expensive to run. Yeah. And the reputation goes down because it's not as charming as it once was. Yeah. And so now you need to infuse your city with more revenue streams to, to get, get the income pump back, those numbers up numbers back up. Yeah. And more things like parks and very uh, uh, a national park or something that will give a lot of appeal for your city back. So your reputation, reputation goes yeah. back up. But again, as you re-speed up that engine, 
it starts to get knocked down quicker and quicker and quicker. Especially once you're way up there on the track, it's very often that you will go down. You can even go into negative money where you start, you're, you're bleeding And, and money. negative reputation where you start losing population. Yeah, and yeah. so it's a really fun like balance of like, how do I keep this engine marching forward as it becomes kind of harder and harder? It's just so fun. We have the collector's edition. Uh, it's just pure tile placement, city building goodness. It's so good. It probably should be higher on my list, but here it is. Well, do, do whatever you want, man. Do whatever you want. <laughs> that's hey, number 58 you, is suburban. You live your life. You know, I'll live mine. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, these are like 57. Uh, like suburbia is next for you, probably. <laughs> no, it's not. 57. Uh, oh, it's, let's go into 57. Oh, I see. Number 57 is a game that we played uh, and don't unfortunately own. I'm so bummed. This is monumental. Oh my gosh. This dude. game, I think, this game makes is the bonkers. list. A, because it's really fun. Yes. B, it's got an insane production behind it. And we, C, we need a content at Fun Forge, man. We got it. What's Fun Forge? Where's that? Monumental is so <laughs> fun. Fun Forge, hit us up. We want this game. <laughs> monumental is a, uh, a kind of civilization themed deck building game. And the thing is, is like, this game has all sorts of minis. It's so Super highly produced. Yeah, like crazy. Crazily produced. Um, and as a result of that, when we got this box to ultimately cover it for Board Game Geek, I was just like, and it's like, the, you know, I think it's Hercules on the front or something. And I was just like, what is this it, game? I don't know. It's probably smashing it's a kind of game where, like, It's right? kind of game where we look at it and go barf. Yeah. It, that's what it looks like. And then, like, I get in and start reading the rules because I'm going to cover it's the game. It's just a Euro game. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, it's just a Euro game. Like, you're doing deck building. You're building out this, this nine card... Uh, uh, grid. Grid, yeah. And you're ultimately going to activate a row and a column of cards. So five cards of the nine. I was like, oh, that's just a deck building game where you get like a hand of cards and you activate those cards. Yeah. It's just put into this different kind of puzzle, which is actually really fun. Really fun puzzle. And you're going out and putting people out on the board and kind of trying to have uh, majorities and areas controlling stuff, but it's not super combat heavy. There's never no. like a point where we're going to roll initiative and roll dice at each other and stuff like that. If I have more stuff than you, I'm going to push you out and vice versa. Well, if I remember correctly, it's like when, you, when you're troops die they just go back to your home they go back spots. to your home yeah they, yeah. Don't, they don't go away yeah yeah they just get kind of pushed back and you kind of repopulate yeah, yeah. out there in the world you have a specific civilization it might be like japan for example they and you have different culture, abilities, different culture there, right? abilities you can kind of upgrade your culture through time while, which will yeah. give you uh player powers and stuff like that that kind of upgrade uh you're getting just different stuff unlocked in the game you're building working on like wonders of the world and stuff like that that go out onto this this map in front of you it's just really fun. It does a lot of those kind of like civilization theme stuff. And the the again, the production value on this is like is through bonkers. the roof. Yeah. There's like uh, heroes and monsters you can incorporate. There's other expansions you can incorporate with more nations and stuff. There's just a lot of material for this game. And we didn't even get into like the heroes. No. We never got to try it. But there's like, it's cool. It's like Hercules and stuff. Or like, like also Shakespeare. Like, Shakespeare. Like, Albert Einstein. You're like, that's amazing. <laughs> and they all give you different, like, yeah. you know, unique powers and stuff like that. But it's ultimately this deck building game where you're trying to get better cards and put them into your row and column. And if, if you, whatever cards you use on turn will, will deplete and you'll refill your, your tableau of cards. So things you might leave behind and really kind of try to build out the right kind of row and column to it activate. It really was incredibly fun. You're managing your money and all that stuff. It's so fun. I want to play yeah. it again so bad because I was so shocked at what the game was that yeah. was in that box. This was a while ago, and it's completely. still in the top 100. I mean, yeah. But it's I, so good. I know. So I want it, good. I want it so bad. Yeah. That's Monumental 57. Oh, man. I want it so bad. Yeah. Someday, maybe. We'll yeah. See. Hopefully, do another Kickstarter. We'll, so if pretty. they do, we'll probably just back it. It's so good. It's so pretty. Monumental 57 is the same game. It's Sushi Roll. Um, and so this game's about sushi. And uh, same with Monumental, huge sushi mechanic in it. Um, <laughs> and so uh, Sushi Roll, Mike talked about a couple lists ago, I think. Uh, sushi Roll is by Praise B. It's got to be one per list. Still Walker Hardy, I'm curious you, if there's legitimately going to be one per list. Oh, it's gosh. very possible. Um, Phil Walker Harding, Praise B. Love Phil Walker Harding. Uh, he might. I'm curious. Is he going to be the person who shows up the most? Might be. Might be. That yeah. or Uwe. It's the battle Probably, between yeah. that and Uwe. But uh, Sushi Roll is the a dice version of Sushi Go or Sushi Go Party. We like it significantly more because the problem with Sushi Go and Sushi Go Party is drafting. People tend to draft cards at different rates and something gets messed up or someone has too many cards or not enough cards or and something happens. lost. <laughs> the dice version is slightly simpler version. Although it's not really simpler than Sushi Go, but it's definitely simpler than Sushi Go Party. Sure. And, but instead you're drafting dice. You're gonna have a little conveyor belt, little sushi conveyor belt, very cute, with these kind of nice chunky dice. 
and then once you get your conveyor belt of dice, you're gonna roll them all out, and then you're gonna draft one of those die, and then you're gonna draft your die in order, and then everyone at the same time goes, da -da 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 -da, and he moves the conveyor belt to the next person. <laughs> so there's no way to be like, drafting cards, go, and, and like get messed no. up, because you yeah, all have to do it at the way. same time. And then, and then once you get a new thing of dice, you grab them, you re-roll them, and then boom. So one thing that's nice that Mike talked about, which is a very good point, is in Sushi Roll, you can see what dice are coming to you. Now again, once you get to them, once they get to you, you're gonna re-roll them every single time you get them. But you know the green dice has like tempura, it has like sashimi and like dumplings on it. Or some more of the purple dice or whatever, whatever it is. Whatever, yeah. The but you is, know you're like, okay. You know what's possible. To you know you're like, okay, so in a couple different turns, there's going to be a mass of purple dice coming my way. So I think I'm going to take this dumpling now because I know there's a fairly good chance that in a round or two, I'm going to be able to get some more. And so you can actually make like plans in this, unlike in like Sushi Go where you don't more. know what's going on. You can plan and then it's just it just simplifies it. It makes it easier. It makes it way, way, way more intuitive. And it's just nice dice. They look really nice. They're really sweet little dice. Very um, nice. And then you're getting pudding. You're doing that kind of stuff. And then it just it just works. It works really really well. I absolutely love it. This is one of those things where like I don't think they will because they haven't at this point. And I assume they would. I think it's trippy. I like, would. That came out three years ago. Yeah, that's the thing. It came out three <laughs> years ago. I don't think it's getting expanded. This is one of those things where like, I would actually like an expansion because sure. I feel like it'd be easier to incorporate it than Sushi Go Party Probably, was. Probably yeah. But nonetheless. I'm not expecting that to happen, but Phil, get on it. Um, and so, Come on, Phil. You still have wasabi, and you're taking nigiri and putting on the wasabi. It's really great. It's, it's all the classic stuff you expect, just in dice form now. And just in a more easy-to-play form. It's really, really good. I like Sushi yeah. Roll a lot. It's my 57. Uh, let's get number 56. I feel like my this list is just Mike's last list or something like that <laughs> because it's it's just kind of my number 56 is Kubitos which I think you talked about in the last uh, I did. one we're gonna have a lot of crossover we like a lot of the same games although I did count there's not nearly as much crossover as last time. as previous list there's yeah. like way less crossover which is yeah. nice we, we yeah we've, we've diversified a bit in our age yeah 56 is Kubitos I really like Kubitos it's kind of like race Quacks and Klingberg there's a lot of similarities to Quacks and Klingberg I definitely like it more than Quacks I don't think Quacks made my top 100 which is surprising considering how much we have played that game but we I have played it a lot. We have. And Kubitos, kind of like Quacks, just goes over really well. This is a game where you're you're um, kind of like a deck building game, but with dice instead. And you're getting these dice. You're going to start off with very basic dice. And you're going to roll them out. And it's a push your luck game where you're rolling them out. And then on the dice, a lot of times they only, like, one or two sides of a die will have anything on them. The other ones will be blank. And then you are putting aside the ones that that um, have a face on them, and then you'll roll over the blank ones. The problem is once you have three dice that have rolled a success something on them, now anytime you're rolling, if you ever roll all blanks, which is relatively likely, you will bust, and all those dice will go away. Tough luck. You're like, I'm rolling eight dice. Sure, they're all one in six chance. One has to you roll. You just convince yourself, you're like, there's no way this can't hit. You do like, it all it the absolutely time. Absolutely cannot Because the, the best die has like three faces. So it's still a 50-50 chance. And it's just, you always, you just it's very, very fun. You get very overconfident. <laughs> and then on these dice, you'll be getting uh, coins, and then you'll get little feet, and the feet allow you to move your little cube person. Ultimately your goal. Because ultimately you're, you're in a race. But then all the dice will also have a specific face on it, like the cat face or something like that. And then you get to activate that die's ability, which could be a whole bunch of different stuff. And there's like seven or eight different kinds of dice, and each of those die has like six or seven different abilities you can it's use crazy. in the game. And so you can like really, really change up the variability. There's also four different boards. There's two double-sided boards. So like you have four different maps to play on, so, so many different ways to play each individual thing. And there's so much variability in this that I'm just, I love it. This is a game like, I remember we played it with Mike's wife, Karen, and she was just like, she loves Kubitos. So and it's fun. just like, yeah, this really weird cube world. I don't know, it's John DeClaire, it rocks. I love Kubitos. This is a game I feel like we'll keep for a very long time oh, yeah. because it just goes over so, so well with so many different people. It just rocks. Kubitos is my 56, it's outstanding. Um. Awesome, that's number, you said 57? 56, you're 56 now. I'm 56? Yeah. What was your 57? So you roll. Oh, Sam, dog. What'd you, what'd you I don't know, Monumental for me, I got lost. Okay. Your 57 was Monumental, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. We're, we're good, we're My good. 56 <laughs> is Power Grid. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry about that, I got so lost. I was really? Like, power Grid, huh? Power Grid, baby. Um, so Power Grid. That's too bad. Is a Freeman Freeze that's game nice. that it's a good. lot of people know is very famous. It's very good. Um, it's a game that, uh, Conference. We hadn't played, we had heard about it, of course. You do hear and about it, Hadn't right? played it in 
ever and uh, and kind of got it built up in our heads like it's really mathy, it's really crazy, it's really hard. I, I don't get that complaint. The math is not I don't that understand hard. it either. Maybe we're just like, geniuses. I mean, maybe, or it's just like maybe calculators exist that are in your hands at all times. So I'm like, it's fine. Um, but this is a game, uh, it kind of does a few things. You're auctioning power grids. I don't know where it is. Uh, power mind. plants, I should say, pardon me, power plants. Uh, every turn you'll get a new power plant, and that's going to give you a uh, uh, an ability to ultimately power certain amount of cities by using certain types of energy, like oil and coal, and then nuclear energy and stuff like that. Yeah. And there's some uh, green energy, which doesn't take anything, and again, typically it's a little less powerful. Yeah. Um, and so each uh, turn you're going to auction off these different... Um, uh, power plants, and they are going to be numbered and become kind of more powerful as the game goes on. So the weaker ones are going to be available now, but you might get some powerful ones later. You get a little bit of a preview of what's to come later. Uh, and then you're going to have a, a section of the turn, of the phase, of the round rather, where you get to put houses out to different cities, and you can play on one side the Germany map, or the other side the United States of America. Um, and you're trying to connect different cities and stuff. And ultimately, the ultimate goal is you want to have a connected chain of cities with a house on them. And you want to power as many houses as you can with the display of power plants that you have yeah. before you. So you're going to be swapping in more and more powerful power plants as the game goes. But really, it's kind of a tight economic game because you have to pay to get those uh, in an auction to get those power plants. You have to pay to build up the infrastructure and the housing and stuff in on the map. You have to pay to get resources from this market. And if a bunch of people are running coal right now, there's not a lot of coal in the market. So coal is very expensive. It's a supply and demand yeah. situation. Uh, as the game goes, we're going to start upgrading to oil and then eventually to nuclear. And you're going to see more and more coal return to the market, which drops the price down. And that's one of my favorite parts about that. Yeah. I think it's really interesting and also true to life. Like yeah. supply and demand is a thing. If there's a lot of people clamoring for the same thing, you're going to pay more for yep. it. Yep. Yep. Uh, and you're just trying to power as many houses as possible. When I find Finally got to this game, I was just shocked at like, oh, this is not as, it's crazy, not as crazy as yeah. I thought it was. And it's actually pretty accessible and like in terms of like what you're doing, and I really enjoy it, and it's just kind of elegant and wonderful, and I get why it's popular. So yeah. Power Grid's my 56. I would like to get a couple different maps for it. There's a ton of maps. Love, there's yeah. a lot of stuff. A lot of maps. Game. I would love it. Stuff. Yeah, we, we haven't explored none of that. No, it's very good though. I it's not I, I was trying to look for it on my list. I have no it's I'm not sure where it is, but I do like Power Grid though. Sure. Uh, that was your what? 56? 6? All right. Let's get into 55. All right. So you were talking recently, Nick, about like which uh, which designers are going to show up the most. I got a new another Uwe right here. It's Patchwork, number 55. Yeah. This is just classic two-player polyomino. You're building a quilt with really funky scraps of material, and you're trying to build as full of a quilt as possible on your player board. You ideally want to have zero empty spaces. Mm -hmm. This is not likely to happen. No. Um, Very, I've never done it. Uh, never have done it. Probably never will. So Patchwork is a really uh, fun, interesting tactical game that for us, like, really seemed to usher in the era of polyomino. It sure seems like it, at least. Yeah, yeah. of, like, the weird Tetris-shaped pieces games. Uh, so many games use it. In fact, like, Uwe took Patchwork, which is basically a section of A Feast for Road, a much larger game, and said, like, this could be its own whole thing. Just work on this puzzle. Right. And now it's far out sold anything else either. <laughs> so um, much money so just good patchwork. for him for me like i don't know maybe this and they're like yes all yes that, that Uve. and more um so patchwork is really fun because you have this kind of like sprawling circle of of um of these strange pieces of fabric and you can always choose one of the three that are in front of the pawn um and the cool thing that i really enjoy about this game is there are two economies yeah. There's a button economy, which Cute. you spend to buy the patch. Yeah. And then when you get a patch, you're also going to spend a certain amount of time. That's you sewing the patch in, right? Uh, and as you, you have like five time on a patch, you're going to move five spaces down this little central board. And whoever is furthest behind on that central board, that's whose, player, whose turn it is. And it will be your turn until you end up in front of the, your opponent. Uh, and so I like the idea that like I have a bunch of buttons but i don't necessarily want to lose a bunch of time because once yeah. you get to the middle of the board you're done that's done. it that's the end of the game for you uh as you place patches down on your quilt of course you're trying to cover up as much of your board as possible some patches come with buttons and there's several points in the game where you're going to cross a little button icon and that means for every button on your quilt you get that many buttons aka money 
uh, to then spend on more stuff. So you're trying to build up that kind of engine there. And the whole, the concept of like, do I want to pay more time for this patch, but less buttons? Or do I want to pay more buttons, but it takes up less time? And which of those kind of currencies is the most valuable to yeah. me right now? It's just, there's a lot of really cool things yeah. in a really simple kind it's, of polyomino game. There's a reason why it's made Uwe a lot of money. Yeah, so that's <laughs> my like, number 55 is a patchwork. It's, it's very, very good. Yeah. All right, my number 55 is a game that got introduced to me by our good friends, Nate and Cindy. Um, and I, I get a game I kind of bring everywhere. I'm Evangelist a ton now. This is Bandito. Uh, yes. Bandito uh, is, I, I've, I'm <laughs> constantly call. trying to play, get people to play this game. I it's love so Bandito. Fun. I think it's outstanding. It comes in a little, it's by Helvetique who make the kind of like oink size games, maybe a little Very bit smaller. Very small boxes, yeah, yeah. Make these little, all their games come in these little boxes. They're also quite good, almost all of them. But Bandito is a game where it's a cooperative game where there's a little tile in the middle, a little bandit in there like, bang. Trying to escape from and prison. he is digging constantly, digging, 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 trying to escape prison. Essentially, there's going to be all these different routes going out of this thing. And on your turn, you have three cards, which are, have different tunnels on them, and you have to put it somewhere. And that is the bandito digging, essentially. And what you're trying to do is cut off all the all the paths. So you can yes. do that by playing the security guards, which are essentially are dead ends, or you can do it by looping a path. So if it comes out and loops back into itself, that's essentially cut off. And so on your turn, you have to play one of your cards and you have three cards in your hand. The game will end either when you block off every single There's exit. There's no way to escape. Not likely. Or <laughs> when you run out of cards. Because the problem is, is what I love about the game is like the ebb and flow of this game. Because you'll get down to the point where you have Ugh. like one exit left. You're yeah, like, okay, we have one exit left. Okay, Mike puts it down, gets it down to one exit, comes to me. They're like, Nick, can you do it? I'm just like, oh, I'm about to mess this up. I'm going to undo bad. everything. Because all did. three cards I have have four four exits to them. So I'm gonna put one right back up. So we just went from one exit now to three, and now we have to try and close off all those. And there's <laughs> there's always a point where you get relatively close and then someone just blows it up because they have no choice. They just have, you have the card. You have you to have. play something. You have to play a card. And so it's this constant like crisis management of trying to not, basically just trying to not make the situation worse <laughs> is basically yes. what you're trying to do. And you very often will have to. And it's just very, very fun. Um, it's so simple. It's like, hey, we're trying to block this off. You have a card, you have to play a card. It takes two seconds to teach you. You just go. It's cooperative. It's fun. The only thing against it is it's a very big game. It's very sprawling. Oh, yeah, big time. Um, but I love Bandito. I think it's so much fun. It's my kind of my go-to little filler cooperative game. I think it's absolutely outstanding. Uh, and big shout-out to Nate and Cindy for um, introducing. Big love, uh, big love. That's number 55. Love it so much, Bandito. Uh, let's get number 54. My number 54, I'm not going to lie, is a game that is going to be, would be high up on a top 10 games that surprised us list, because I just wasn't expecting anything from this game. This is Long Shot the Dice Game. Oh, yeah. Like, this, just, I mean, went way beyond our expectations. <laughs> way beyond. Way beyond. Long Shot the Dice Game is a roll and write game. It's based on the game Long Shot, which we've never actually played. It's a horse race betting game. We got hit up um, by Chris Handy, who makes the game, to play this game on stream. We're like, yeah, sure. Like, we, you know, we're, we're corporate shills. We'll do anything for money. Whatever. Um, and so we're like, sure, we'll play the game. But we weren't really expecting too much. And it is so much fun. This game is a, you're simulating a horse race. There's a board in the middle which have eight different horses, one through eight. And on your turn, you're going to roll a die, and that die is a D8, and that will dictate what horse is going to move. But then on each horse, there's also, uh, you can also move other horses. And it's yeah. a horse race, so you're betting on who you think is going to win. You are um, placing bets, and, and you're um, marking off concessions, and you can also like purchase horses. So if your horse comes in like first, you second, or third, you'll get that. extra money. Yeah. And you're placing down these bets using your money, and uh, it's just it just works really really well because in the end you're going off a dice roll and that's what that's what horse that's <laughs> you can't moving con you you can, you can do a little you can't control the race much no you so. can't control the race much but again on each horse like say the number one horse the other horses two through eight will be on the bottom of that card and you can mark off on there one of the things you can do is you can be like okay I'm gonna mark off this so now whenever the one horse moves the four horse also moves because yeah, I got money in on the four horse. I got one in the four horse so now it, and if the one moves you're like okay great. The one just moved, that's awesome. And there's just so much, like, so many times in this game where it's like, the eight horse is in the back. The eight horse ain't moving <laughs> at the all. They're the long shot, they're the long shot. And then, for, then they just come racing around <laughs> and just like, it's just a very You start getting excited, slow, start spending your money. 
It's kind of like ready, set, bet, but in slow motion in times like yeah, you're yeah, like, yeah. You're like go, it's real time, go, go. But it's go. the same thing. And it's just, this is a really, really fun roll route. You're trying to have the most money. At the end of the game, you'll get points for horses that came in first, second, or third, depending on like if you uh, place bets on them or if you own that horse. Different concessions. You want to have like your jockeys and like jerseys and helmets and stuff like that. A couple different ways to score, but you're essentially trying to get money. And this is a game board. Again, like we, we're, we're like, oh, sure, we'll play that game. I'm sure it'll be fine, like because most board games are fine nowadays. Yeah. And it like, we were like, Blue this away. is so much fun. It's one of my favorite rolling rights. It's in my, it's on my 54, best game of all time, in my opinion, right now, at least. Like, I freaking love Long Shot the Dice it's game. It's really fun. And that's a game where you introduce it, people are like, wow, that was really fun. And it's like, yeah, right? I love Long Shot the Dice it's game. It's the whole, like, betting element and, like, see, the way that the race will change and stuff is just so It's exciting. so much fun. Yeah. 54, Long Shot the Dice game, it's absolutely outstanding. Nice. My number 54 is a, uh, a card drafting game that... Um, it's just so good, despite me being so bad at it. It's a, it's a wonderful world, is the game. Does you being horrible at it affect your enjoyment of it? No, it doesn't. Okay. It's a, it's a, I'm immune to that, and I am so bad at this game. You are I not good at this do game. not know how you score points. It's true. I know that people can do it. I will never do it. True. Ah, it's, I, I, I don't know. How, I literally I don't know how to do it. Uh, it is a, uh, a card drafting engine building game where you are going to draft out cards, and then you're going to decide with those cards that you drafted, you're going to decide what to do with them. Do you put them down to try to construct them? Or you can kind of discard them and they will produce like a resource for you. And that is a big piece of that game is like, do yeah. not overcommit to constructing stuff. Yeah. Most things are going to get recycled uh, for their bit of resources that they provide. But if you do get a, uh, a card down and construct it, it goes into your empire and then it's going to probably produce resources for you or it will open up scoring opportunities at the end of the game or it might get you a bonus right when you complete the building, something to that effect. Uh, and that's ultimately your goal is to build up as many constructed cards in your empire as you possibly can. Hopefully they're synergistic so that they score lots of points. Again, I wouldn't know how to speak on that part. He doesn't, yes. I don't get how people get points. Um, but this game... <sighs> It is so fun to build that engine yes, um, and then start producing resources with it. And when you go in the production phase, it's kind of extra satisfying because what you'll do is you will go through, and there's five types of resources, you will produce them in order every time. So the first thing will be materials. They're kind of like the white resources, the gray resources. They're kind of the most plain basic resources. You'll look at your empire. How many of those do you produce i produce five nick produces four we grab those resources and you immediately add them yeah. to cards that you have in construction so in the middle of the production phase you can complete cards and add them to your empire and if it's if it's a uh i complete a card and it produces like the black resources we haven't produced black yet so when we get to black i get to use that yeah, brand new which card is, that part of the game is so much it's nicer. so fun to try to like complete stuff in the middle of that production like that's one thing that immediately probably... make use of it so it probably cool. wasn't always that way. And then one point they're like, let's try it this way. We could use this card. It's just so And awesome. it just makes it so much better. Yeah. It's so fun. It's a quick game. It's four rounds and out. And you yeah. get to get a lot of stuff done. You feel like you've really built up an engine in that time. Uh, and, that, and that is so fun to me that I don't care that the inevitability of me not scoring any points <laughs> is coming because uh, I have so much fun. There's all sorts of cards that will score for like these different tokens you can get based on if I produce the most white, I'll get a special token that'll yep. be worth a point. And this thing might give me a bonus point for all those I own. So effectively, these are now worth two points a piece. There's a lot of kind of synergies you can try to build and really kind of focus on something that's going to be maximized for scoring. Yeah. Uh, and it's just so fun. It's a great card drafting game. Yeah. I love it. It's a wonderful world. All right. Number, number 54? 54. 54. All right. Let's get number 53. Number 53 is an area control game that might be my favorite area control game because it's kind of so abstract and stuff. This is World's Fair 1893. Mm, yeah, it was, it's weird to think of it that way, but that's what it is. It yeah. is. Yeah, you're trying to, or area majority, yeah, or, yeah. you know, because you're not fighting or anything. Uh, in this World's game, wow, <laughs> in this game. Are like, you that one dude? Yeah. I'm the <laughs> devil in the white suit. <laughs> yeah, you're that guy. Yeah. Yeah. When's that expansion coming? Uh, so uh, it, we were at the World's Fair 1893 in the year of our Lord, 1893. And uh, we are visiting or, or putting on uh, exhibitions and stuff in the kind of five categories of the fair. One was like electricity, because it was a new thing, man. Uh, agriculture and stuff, inventions and things. There's different arts uh, or different areas of the fair. And we're trying to basically have as many of our supporters in each of those yeah. five regions as possible to be able to score points and be able to gain 
uh, these kind of set collection tokens and stuff like that for the end of the game. Um, as you're going uh, to a certain location stuff, you're going to be collecting these cards, which are going to then be turned into those tokens if you manage to win a region. Uh, so you might want to get a bunch of green, and hopefully I win green, and can turn those green into tokens, which means they're points. Um, and then there's these, like, these characters that any characters you have in hand when you go to do your turn, you got to use all your characters that might yeah. give you additional supporters. You can move supporters yeah. around, different things to that effect. There's also midway tickets, which are pure set collection within the round, and they also time the round yeah. out. And if you get uh, the most midway tickets, uh, you'll get a little bit of extra money, yeah. which is also points. points. Um, this game is one that like I'm super charmed by the theme. Yeah. The board itself, all those regions are central center uh, around this and they create a Ferris wheel which was like a massive feature of yeah. the World's Fair because you're like again, this was new technology at the time. Right. Uh, and so it's just a really cool looking game. And on all of the cards, if you take a second to look, they're all like real inventions and real people yeah. that were at the World's Fair and real items that were there. And so there's just a lot of like fun little fan service if you take a second to read what's on the cards. Yeah. Um, and then uh, and then there's a little bit of an area control situation going on. So yeah, it's just like really smooth and simple. It's really outstanding. Gives you um, that good area control feel without being like combative and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And that's why I like it. It's uh, 53 World's Fair 1893. It's very, very good. My number 53 is a uh, trick taking game to the world by storm. This is the crew. Mission Deep Sea technically, but both crews are fine. But Mission Either Deep Sea crew. is better. Um, this is a cooperative trick taking game. I remember when this game came out people were just, I mean, we were on the cruise and Corey, uh, oh, our good friend Corey was just like, he was trying to get everyone to play with him and everyone just kept being like, it's so good. And we kept being like, why? It's well, a cooperative, okay, it is it's a cooperative yeah. game and it's very, very good. This yeah. is a game where you're gonna have a certain amount of tasks um, and you're gonna have to divvy out, depending on the what game you're playing, you're like, you're uh, technically going through some kind of campaign or whatever and stuff, yeah, basically. A, you're going to have tasks that you're going to be divvying out to different people for the most part. And those tasks might be like, I will only win three tricks. Mike will not take the pink seven or something like that. Everyone has these different tasks. Right. And so you're trick taking together, trying to make sure that everyone gets to fulfill their various tasks. And it can be very difficult to do. And there are certain tasks that are harder than the other ones. And one of the main differences between the first crew and the second crew and why the second crew is better is instead of just having straight up tasks, each task will have essentially a difficulty level. Yeah. Like, and they can go from like one, which is like pretty darn easy to do, all the way up to like five, which is like really hard to do. So this particular like mission that you're going on will be like, hey, you need to have six difficulty of tasks. Yeah, so and how then you, those come out is random. And but. so you might get a five and then a one and that's it. Or you might get two, three twos. And it kind of depends on the game. And so yeah, like and that- also scale for player count, which is yes. Nice. And that makes it so much better because now it's like you can just play it that way forever. Just being like, hey, we're gonna have a certain difficulty amount. We gotta see if we can make it work. That's it. And it just, it works so well. I really think the crew is so much fun. And I think it's a really good intro to trick taking because it is cooperative. The thing about trick taking is we talked about this before is like there's such a hidden language that you're speaking throughout the game. Being like, yeah. I played this card and then everyone else should know oh, that means Nick doesn't have blues. Yeah. But the thing is, if you're not good at trick taking, you might not pick up on that language. And I think the crew, sure. especially some of the earlier missions, which are a little bit easier, are a great, great way to start to learn that language. Because that's such a fun language to develop yes, and it stuff. Is. But it's nice to do it in a way where like everybody wants to get better. And so you're you're gonna openly talk about it, and hopefully not in like a quarterbacking way. If you're yeah, if you're yeah. no trick taking, like bring people in gently and stuff. But I think it's so fun to be like, this is what I was trying to communicate, and it can be that moment of like, oh, because oh. I, I I came up in trick taking playing spades, and there was those moments where my teammate would say like, this is what I was trying to tell you with that. I was just like, oh dang, I would I didn't know that that's yeah, how that works. Realize now that. you can see it, and it's yeah. so fun to play that sub communication via the card play. It's so good. And both crews are great. But Mission Deep Sea, uh, they're both like 15 bucks. So like, get it, whatever you Amongst want. the best values uh, yes. ever for a board game. Just can play it forever. It's so freaking good. The crew yeah. is honestly so, so fun. So um, good. My number 53, I absolutely adore it. Um, yes, my number 53, let's get into 52, yeah? Ooh, yeah. 52 is another game that we tend to evangelize a lot with our good friend Crystal Dax. This is Castell. Castell. Be about it. Wear it out though is a game that, again, kind of by Renegade Games, unfortunately, a lot of these games from Renegade, they just come out and then they, they just go away, basically. 
Castel is one of those games that's got such a cool theme where you are uh, Castellers, which in the Catalonia region of Spain, and those are those people who make those big human pyramids, big it's human like towers. Crazy tall, yeah. Crazy stuff, I, uh, so cool. I don't know how and you are, does that. <laughs> I, know, say, I want to be the people on the bottom. Search room. it on YouTube. It's people at the bottom are all just like this, like, we got it! We can do I want it! To be, I want to be one of those guys. I yeah, want to be one of those I don't want to be any higher than the floor. Yeah, I just want to be like, ah, and everyone is pushing them like that. I love it. It's so cool. It's amazing. But nonetheless, um, you are a troop of castellers, and you are going around the, the region of Spain that this happens, and you're essentially putting on these different performances. Throughout the game, you will know what regions you'll need to be in to put on performance. Like, hey, in this area, in Barcelona, we are going to have a, um, a festival on this day. You need to be there to be a part of it. Yep. If you're not there, you cannot participate in that festival, not basically. The troops aren't there. When you are there, you're going to take your castellers with all these little tiles, and they are different values. So, like, the tens are, like, the big dudes on the very bottom. Yep. The nines are, like, these big burly women on the next floor up, and they get yep. smaller and smaller and smaller as they and go so up, they of have course. children at the top. And then you have... You know, babies at the very top. You know, just, 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 just six months. And about old. that, you have just the idea of children. <laughs> just children here, yeah, are so small. So basically, and so, and then you're building out this, and then there are very specific rules where your tower can only be three things wide, and then everyone up from has there to taper. has to taper, and then you can never put like the same number on top of each other. So you can't put a ten on top of a ten, a five on top of five, and like that. A smaller number. But then throughout the game, every round, you get to train in something. So you can train in like strength or you can train in like width. And what that means is it allows you to start breaking those rules. So if you train in width, that means now your tower can be a maximum of four wide. Yes. So instead of having to go three, two, one, which is not a very big tower, you can now go four, three, two, one. Training in strength means you can have the same number on top of itself one time. So you can have like 10, nine, nine, eight, seven, six, da, 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 like that. Training in balance means you don't have to taper on one level. You can have the same width. And so you have all these ways to break these rules. It's awesome. And it's so much fun. And then on top of that, you're traveling around Spain trying to get to these specific locations. There's also like these kind of like exhibition tiles where essentially you're just kind of showing off your the skills showcase. Your skills kinda, showcase, yeah. right? And you can do those in the various cities. You're getting all these points. And throughout the game, what's interesting is you're also recruiting all these Castellers, but at the end of the game, you're only ever gonna score your single best performance. So yeah. basically, if you score like 10 on the first one, and then you score 12 on the first one, your thing moves up to 12, but if then on the next one you score eight, it just stays at 12. Yeah, it's not a cumulative score situation. It's not, so the thing is you really need to be improving every single festival, or essentially you're just wasting time, yeah. because at the end of the game, your score starts wherever your best festival was. So if your best festival was like 26, that's where your score is gonna start, and then you do your end game scoring. And so it's this really interesting push and pull. You're probably not gonna be able to get into every single festival because it's kind of hard to move around. Yep. So it's like this really interesting, tough puzzle. It's a really big, really tight puzzle you have to do that just works so well. It's got a, such a cool theme. It's got cool art. It's just yeah, so it's different great. and interesting. I freaking love Castella. No one ever talks about it, ever plays, but it makes me sad. It's a shame. It's a shame. Because I love it. Uh, that's so 52 52 for you. Two. Yep. All right, very nice. Castell's a great pick. My number 52 is another Uwe. It's Cover another Cave Farmers. Ooh, hi. Uh, yeah, it's high up there, man. It's a it's a biggie. We don't play it as often it's as really good, we should though. because I think it's just... We need to get some 3D inserts like we have for Feast for Odin because it's so hard to get out of the box and get going with. Yes, and I'm like, it is. Oh, I'll play something else. It's bonkers. But it's so fun if you do get to play it. So, and we have expansion materials we haven't tried. It's fine. It's going to be great. Converter of the Cave Farmers is another big Uwe Rosenberg game, uh, very much based off Agricola. Uh, there's a lot of blueprint of Agricola in Caverna, and it changes up a couple things. So now you're not just farming out in the lands, you're also building out a cave. Where you live, you know, you're, yeah. you're these dwarves. dwarves. You gotta live in a nice cave. Yeah. You can go out and farm out in the land and stuff. We gotta return back Barf, home to yeah. the cave and build out rooms in that cave and stuff and mines and things like that. So, uh, this game is a worker placement game, and I enjoy it because it's just fun to try to like maximize what you can do in a game. And there's a bunch of negative points for stuff that's not covered up. So you want to get everything covered up. There's a bunch of buildings that all do different things. And there's like so many of them to explore. Yeah, right. So it's like, I'm gonna try this building. That's gonna give me points for wood. So I'm gonna try to focus on wood and stuff. And one thing that we really enjoy is at the start of the game, there's already a good handful of yeah. worker placement there's spots. Like 12 or something like that, yeah. <laughs> but then every round you will flip over a new worker placement spot. So you're not like a Feast for Odin where you have a 
billion to begin with, you kind of reveal them through yeah, time, which is, nice. which is kind of nice and stuff. And you can go, there's some that are very basic, like get these resources like wood or stone. Uh, other ones let you go on adventures and your little uh, dwarves get stronger and stuff and you get better... Uh, uh, better things when you kind of go out on adventures in the future. You can get better uh, returns on that. Um, again, you can have animals. You want to have those animals breed. You can plant vegetables and stuff. You want to have those vegetables harvest and grow to produce food because, of course, you got to feed your people. Yeah. Uh, every dwarf at the end of the round requires two food. Uh, little babies require one. How adorable because they're small. Um, and it's just... Fun. There's like five or six types of animals. There's just in this game. There's just a lot. There's so and much so stuff. as a result, similar to like why I like Feast Road, and it's just fun to explore like certain facets of. It. I'm getting a ton of pigs this game, you know. Yeah, and right? you Try to go pig heavy and, and figure it out. Uh, but there's the the always the focus of like one is specialized on something, but you also have to kind of diversify, lest you incur penalties for not having all the types of animals. For every animal type you're missing, you lose some points. Yeah, so right. it's like ah, uh, you know. But how do you work within those kind of um, Parameters, and from what we understand, we haven't tried a Gricklow, and know we need to. Um, Caverna, I think, is just ever so slightly less punishing. This one seems like um, it. and then like something like Feast for Odin's even less so, uh, which I do like more than Caverna. But Caverna is just really fun, it's really fun, it's big and beefy. Um, but I just like the stuff that we're doing in the yeah. game, so I, I always want to play more. And then the expansion material we have gives you like asymmetric I'm player powers, that, yeah. which I think for us is really going to make it more enticing yeah. to get back to the table. So I think, yeah, I think, I think if that works well, the player powers, I think it could push it real high. Agreed, agreed. So yeah. right now it's fifty-two. That's Caberno, the Cave Farmers. Let's All get right, fifty-one. Ooh, Mike, you what just missed the top fifty? What ended up barely in the trash pile? Well, you know what? It barely made your list and stuff. And you had said, and I think it's true, is that with more plays, this will rise. This is Glenmore 2 oh, yeah, Chronicles. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Glenmore uh, 2 is, as Nick talked about in a couple lists ago. Shows how much you like it, that it's 51. Yeah. Right? Like, because yeah. it's style placement goodness and the Scottish Highlands and it's whatnot. Yeah. Uh, in this game, you are, uh, we're kind of on a rondelle, so similar, it's like almost like a patchwork, yeah. but without the limitations on how far you can move. Yeah. Um, there's all these different tiles that you can place down um, onto your grid. Some tiles will produce resources, others will allow you to do like trades of resources and things like that. There's a little bit of a market where you can uh, gain and spend resources to, to do stuff. And you're trying to build out your little kind of highland kingdom or whatever we would call it. Uh, in ideally as little of a sprawling way as possible. Which is surprising. Usually it's the other way around, right? You don't, if you have the most tiles in the game, you're actually gonna get, you're gonna lose some points for as a result. But now maybe they'll be worth it because you'll have gained so many from you know the, the different giant uh, landscapes you built. But um, what you're gonna do is you're going to place a tile and you get to activate that tile and everything around it, which is already really cool. So you can produce a bunch of resources, for example, to then spend on uh, some tiles and stuff have costs. There's like whiskey going on. You can turn whiskey into points and whatnot. Uh, and there's some tiles that provide like movement points. You can move your people around uh, to different uh, areas, which is important because I can't just put tiles down willy nilly. I need to put them adjacent to where I have one of my people. Yeah, makes sense. Because they're the ones developing that land. So there's kind of those uh, puzzly uh, things to consider. There's this kind of highland board where um, you can get people essentially then move around on the board and get these little one-time bonuses or sometimes open up endgame scoring and stuff like that. Um, and the reason this game is really fun and why we expect it to go higher is there's a whole bunch of modules. I mean, there's Hell eight modules, modules yeah. in the game. There's even expansion material now for the game too uh, that are going to change up certain things. So for one example that Nick laid out a couple lists ago, there's a river. Everyone has one river in their, in their player area. Uh, and the first module gives you a little boat and you can race around where you're actually going to go through all of your river. Um, and you can do this instead of moving your people, you can move your ship. And once you get to the end of your uh, kingdom, your river, you'll bop over to the next player's uh, beginning of their river. You'll go through their river and you're going to go all the way around the table. And if you make it back to the uh, end of your thing first, you're going to get bonuses. If you make it last or don't complete, you're going to get... It's pretty significant. It's not great. Penalized. It's not great, yeah. Um, and that's just like one module. And then there's a bunch of mod modules, some that are more involved than others, but you can incorporate some, multiple. All, if you're crazy, try to go for all of them. That would probably be too much. Um, but there's a lot to explore in a tile lane game where it's all about the adjacency of what you have placed where and stuff like that. Uh, and it's really exciting. So there's just uh, things that give you more workers to put out on your board. Uh, at the end of the game, you kind of want to bring all your workers together. There's just a lot of fun things to kind of consider. Mm -hmm. It's super good. Um, and we haven't explored... 
Hardly any. Hardly any of it. So uh, that's my 51, Glenmore 2. All right, my number 51. What just missed, man? Just what's, missed. What's just, just on the other side missed. of the gate looking in? It's us. It's us? It's Stop Thief, so it's literally us. Wow. Because we are in Stop Thief. It's true. We are. It's very fun. Um, wow, Stop man. Thief. Yeah, I know. We, we literally, wow. we are in Stop Thief. It's very, it's very cool. Um, it is very awesome. Stop Thief is a great game. For Restoration Games, shout out Restoration Games. OG sponsors. OG sponsors. Always going to be sponsor daddies. Um, so Stop Thief is a... Uh, 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 Obviously, a new version of Stop Thief, the old, like, I think, game from the 70s or so. But basically, this is a game where there are going to be um, robbers running around. We usually play the cooperative version. You can play cooperative, you can play competitive, you can play one versus all, you can play solo. There's actually a lot of different ways to play this. Cooperatives yeah. are, are the Absolutely only way we ever play. So we play cooperative, and basically, we're trying to find this group of thieves, and they are going around this board and stealing stuff, and we can figure out where they are through audio clues. So it's run by an app, and that app will tell you. You'll hear where they are. So you hear like like hear them walking inside, or you hear them breaking a window, or you hear them open up a door. You can hear them going into like the subway. And so you go, okay, they walked in door, they walked in door, they hit they a door, a and then they broke a yeah. window. And so you can start like deducing where they are based off of the pattern of the um, yeah, it'll, audio it'll, clues. It'll limit like what where they could be. Yes. Well, they can't be here because there's not a door. Next, okay, so they can't be in this part of this building. We think they're over here, and you can figure it out like that. And then once you think we, you know where they are, you can essentially try to make an arrest. If you make an arrest successfully, you find them. You get to take one of the the villains, and you get to throw them away, kill them in the trash. Um, and then the next one comes out, and all the villains also have an ongoing ability for the most part. So it might be like if they. <laughs> Or kill them. It was like, wow, Swift justice, man. <laughs> it's like we live in the dread universe where, like, the <laughs> yeah, judges are executioners, too. Like, you know. Oh, um, so it took me a second, but I was just like, that's funny. So, Sorry, continue. so basically, we're in Mega City One and you're going floor to floor trying to find Mama, right? <laughs> it's a dread's a great movie, by the way. God, where's the re theme of that? Dude, let's go. Let's go. But nonetheless, um, and then if you capture them, uh, the, the thieves will have a special ability, which usually make it harder, which means like this one might be like, if they, they ever on a window spot, they essentially get to move again. And yeah. so you're, you're trying to figure it out and they're going around trying to steal stuff. You have $50,000. If they ever steal $50,000 worth of stuff, you lose. That's and then it. if you ever make a false arrest, like you thought they were there and it turns out they weren't, you lose $1,000. You can also get a private tip, which will give you um, a region of where they're gonna be in. That also costs you $1,000. And then each character has a little bit of a special power too. And it's just really, really fun. It's really fun to work together to deduce this whole thing. Um, and it just works. It works yeah. really well. And Restoration Games surprised us with that. They kind of reprinted it. And they put us in it. They put us, we're the wheel men. Yeah, we're some of the villains. We're some of the villains, which is really, really cool. So I, I made us run out to the top 50. Are, is Stop Thief in the top 50 for you? I think so. Okay, wow. Well, so Mike, like, Mike likes us more than Stay I do. Stay tuned apparently. for later. But nonetheless, guys, I'm like 51. Man. Stop Thief. I absolutely love it. I think it's great. And that is our 50. That's the end of the first half, One to 100. Oh, oh. If you're still with us, thank you so yeah. much. We hope that you've been enjoying this entire series. It's really fun to wrap down, you know, the, our favorite games and just wax yeah. poetic about them. So yeah. uh, that is the end of our first half. Down here, you will see a bunch of patrons scrolling by. Uh, patrons, first of all, thank you so much. Thank if you. If you uh, have a couple extra bucks this time of year and you haven't donated over here, which you should also do, and do that first. That's first. You have a couple yes. extra dollars, become Give a patron us, yeah. today. <laughs> we do extra content on all of our top tens. Uh, we have yeah. uh, additional That's tens like a that second go list, out. A second list yeah. that goes out on our Patreon. Uh, and we're going to be doing uh, additional... Our 1 to 200 games will drop on our Patreon first and then YouTube later. Yeah. And then our 2 to 300 games, we're going to do a casual chat about that will only be on Patreon. Yeah. So you want to hear us keep talking about these games, uh, become a patron today. Indeed. All right. And that's going to be it. Uh, my name is Nick Murphy. I'm Mike Murphy. We're the Brothers Murphy. We'll see you in the top 50 of butts. Ooh, bye, everybody. Ooh. Thank you so much for watching that latest top 100 games of all time. We really appreciate it and you. Make sure to check out Tabletop Alliance if you haven't already. If you got a couple extra bucks, kick them that way. We really would appreciate it. And if you got any extra games, kick them their way as well. Make sure to check out our channel sponsors, Chan uh, Restoration Games, Lucky Duck Games, and Board Game Geek. And we want to give a very special shout out to our month sponsor, the Supreme Padishah Emperor of the Known Universe, Greg White. That is how Greg has to be referred to as. So thank you so much, Greg, for sponsoring the Bros. Bro for the month of December. It's your birthday month. You specifically requested this month. Congrats. You got it. Thanks so much, Greg.